The ball will end up in the hands of Tom Brady. And there it is. The dynasty continues. And Virginia with the all-time turnaround title. This is the minute the millions around the world have waited for. Many doubted we'd ever see it, but here it is. The return to glory. Yeah, what a few week stretch for Jim Nance, the only commentator, the only play by play man, the only voice to call a Super Bowl men's final four national championship and a Masters. And he keeps doing it and doing it and doing it. And what a triple header it was this year. And Jim Nance, the day after the football schedule has been revealed, kind enough to join us here a few days after the Masters that Tiger won right here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Jim? I'm great. Thank you for playing those clips. I'd heard the dynasty continues. I had not heard the Virginia end of the game call uh, because I headed straight to Augusta and I had to immediately move into master's mode. Yes, right. And uh, I have heard the return to glory, but to stitch all three of them together, it just flooded my mind with memories of these 63 days that I went through and how fortunate I have been to be a front row witness to some of these remarkable minutes and moments. I mean, Tom Brady, winning another Super Bowl and Bill Belichick and all that. And then that Virginia story was so rich. And then, of course, the Tiger one. Uh, you know, it's just, again, just dumb luck being in the right place at the right time. But it sure has been exciting and hard to beat. Well, I'd, I'd ask you to, to rank where the moments rank for you, Jim. Um, but I, I can only imagine that's a very simple answer. But I'll just let you answer that question. You know, I got asked that question by a great young writer at the Washington Post a couple of days ago, and I know it got picked up in a lot of places. And I said at the time uh, that I probably can't think of any event that I've called in my life that was bigger than the Tiger win on Sunday. Now, look, again, I count my blessings that CBS has entrusted me with these things for so many years, 34, 34 Masters, 34 Final Fours, um, a handful of Super Bowls and some other things. And it's kind of hard to compare sport to sport, but I think I was just uh, talking about you take the, the, the texture of the story. After all, when you're a play-by-play caller, you're a storyteller. You're not a statistician. You're, you're, you're really there to get to the heart of the story. And that one just runs deep at so many levels that, again, you have to show restraint. You can't go into it all because it's a visual medium. But most of the people were aware of Tiger's life and where it had gone, where it had been, how he was on top of the world, it seemed, and then it came crashing down, uh, both physically, emotionally, you know, family-wise, all of that. And then to see what appeared to be a remade man behind that green on Sunday uh, with, a, in, with an intense, deeply affectionate moment with his family, it was moving. And it's just kind of hard to beat that, just given the the arc of that story and where he'd been, where, you know, how far he'd fallen, how he rose back. It's just hard to say there's a better storytelling event that I've ever been a part of or been an eyewitness to. Well, and the crew and your the, the crew that you are uh, face front uh, on behalf of, Jim, that that them to piece together the Earl Woods hug of Tiger with Tiger hugging his son Charlie. That really that uh, that g- brought a tear. I mean, and uh, uh, we 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 always say that brings a tear to your eye, and that that's such an overused phrase, but it really did. I, I literally started tearing up. I'm wondering what you, uh, you know, you see that, or somebody gets in your ear as you're sitting there uh, broadcasting. They're like, "Hey, we got this." I mean, walk me through how you how that hit you. Well, I think everyone I've heard from has said the same thing. That moment really struck them. It was relatable to all of us. And I'll back you up to the 18th fairway, Tiger contemplating how he's going to play his second shot, knowing he needs to make just a five, a bogey to win. Steve Milton, our director, cut to a shot behind the green, and there was Tiger's mom, Coltita. She has been out of public view for a long time. Yeah, I hadn't seen her in forever. And yeah, exactly. Forever. She's there, and I identified Charlie in the foreground, Sam, his daughter, in the back and his girlfriend, Erica, and as soon as I knew that they were in place, my mind instantly went to 97, that we were going to see a scene that was going to hmm. rival that moment with his dad. And I and I even, just as a, a point of context, mentioned that Tiger got emotional in 06 when he won a Royal uh, Hoylake, and uh, 
uh, at uh, the Open Championship, and it was the first major he won after his father had passed away two months earlier. And I thought that this could be, for Tiger, one of the all-time moments in victory. So it was at that time I started to try to think about, okay, how am I going to like sign off on this thing? And the word that kept popping in my head was glory. Glory being, I thought, a strong word because I, I thought it was his game was returning to glory, which was basically extinct two years ago. Let's face it, he was 780th in the world. He was telling people at the Champions Dinner in 2017 he would probably never play again. And then, of course, the fact that, not that we need to know everything, but we know that his family life took a massive hit and and all of that, the scandal that he lived through, and he, everything I've ever heard since that time is how he's dedicated his life to trying to get these kids to understand that you know, his dad made mistakes, and that's not who he is. And he was dedicating his life to those two children to have a different point of view of when they grow up of who their father is. The father that they knew loved them. He was a dedicated and loyal father. It's all I've ever heard for these last five or six years, driven to give those kids, to rewrite the story of his life to a positive, a wonderful, loving relationship. But, you know, we don't get, nor are we supposed to. Everybody wants him to be on all the time for us. He's on this planet, we think, to perform for us. But the reality is 98% of his life is, is behind and shielded from public view. And, you know, we all have lives. You know, you're not just on the air all the time. You have a family and a wonderful family life, as do I. I don't walk around all day long with a blue blazer in my hand and a microphone <laughs> announcing and saying hello, friends. <laughs> you know, I have a life, and it's a rich one, and it's with my family that it's nothing more important. And I've heard the same thing. That's what Tiger's been about. Dedicated dad with his kids' lives and, and all that. And when, when you saw the hug, the intensity and the warmth of it, you knew that it was real. It validated. It, it confirmed everything I had heard. It was a wonderful thing to see. So we let the scene play out. I did use the word glory, the return to glory, because it's a return to glory of his life as well as his golf game. And after that played out for a couple of minutes, uh, I finally... Uh, inserted that I never thought I would see a moment that could rival the hug with his father in 1997, but I think we just did. And then Nick said it was the greatest celebration scene of all time. Nothing can ever top it. And then I said that hug with his family, if you're a parent and you didn't have a tear in your eye, you're not human. And, you know, you're ad-libbing through all of this, mm -hmm. and you're trying to feel the moment. Golf is a feel sport. Football, you can't take three snaps off and not say anything. Basketball, the run up and down the floor, and it's the actions moving at a rapid pace. In golf, I, I, I know that some people get lost on this, but it's it's a sport where it takes a tremendous amount of like living into that vibe, feeling that what that scene and that moment and the intensity or the lack of intensity or the emotion, whatever it is, you have to kind of like lose yourself in it. That's how I've always broadcast golf. Never had a note in front of me. I, I have enough information from a lifetime of preparation cataloged in my head. I can deal up, you know, dial up dates and names and places in historical context. I feel like something I've trained myself to do, and it's a strength for me. And then I talk from my heart. And, you know, there weren't a lot of words said there at the end, but I wanted them to be impactful. And, uh, yeah, it was, it's a hard moment to say there's anything any better than that. Over in the golf world, now you want to talk football here. No, no. I'll just say this. In 86... In 86, when, when Jack won, I was there. I was 26 years old, three and a half years removed from graduating from the University of Houston, and, and I couldn't believe I was there. I was mortified by the enormity of the moment. And I was on the 16th hole that day, and Jack made a pivotal birdie. And people have said there will never be anything that will top the 86 Masters. Well, this might have only in this regard, because I love Jack Nicholas, and that family is like family to me now. I love them. And, um, and Jack's been a great, dear mentor and friend. But in, when Jack won at 86, there were still four pairings out on the golf course. You still had Seve and Tom Kite and Greg Norman to come through. And had Greg and, and Tom both not bogeyed 18, there would have been a playoff. So when Jack exited the 18th green, arm in arm with his son Jackie, who was caddying for him, Frank stayed with the shot only for about three or four seconds. And then he cut quickly out to something that was happening on my hole at 16. I think it was a Norman putt for birdie. So we didn't get the chance. We didn't get the, the, the incredible scene that we had displayed there the ringing of the 18th and thousands of people a chorus celebrating pure joy we didn't have that 
So that, to me, breaks the tie. They're, they're the two best golf events, I think, of all time. And I give the edge here because of, again, the story of the rise from the depths and the scene at the 18th. I mean, you stuck the landing, obviously, uh, on Sunday. And then in, in retelling the story, I could listen to you talk this, this way and about golf all day, Jim. Uh, Jim Nance of uh, CBS here on the Rich Eisen Show. And before we do talk football, I, I do want to, I guess, move backwards in the montage that uh, started our conversation. Uh, if I had told you after you called the UMBC upset of Virginia at that moment, at that very moment, that next year Virginia would win it all, what would you have said? Uh, I would not have been surprised because I believe in the power of the story. I believe sometimes these things, again, I'm going to spin off in a crazy orbit here. Go for it. I told this to someone else the other day, but I, I really believe sometimes these things write themselves and there's a higher power or somebody that's influencing some of this stuff. But if you, if you were to Google search my name in the Richmond Times from October 15th or 16th, I was interviewed by a writer there because uh, camp was opening that day. And for the Virginia basketball team, and I was asked how I think their season would go, and I basically said I thought they would make a great run and maybe win the national championship. I thought the story had a part two to it. And um, I, I mean, I, I didn't say they're going to win the national championship, but I, I, I said it wouldn't surprise me to see they turn around and flip this script and they, they, they take the title. And that's what they did. Now, for that to happen, though, they had to be reminded every day, every practice, every media encounter, they had to be reminded about UNBC. Then they had to play a Purdue team that had them beat with seconds to go. They had to make a free throw, miss a free throw, tap it to the backcourt, have Kihei Clark chase it down three-quarters court, and like 99% of all players would do, would have taken a heave from half court and missed, he had a presence of mind to look up and rifle a pass to Mamadi Diakite, and he hit a runner to send it to overtime. That's you right. can't win that game. That's one in a thousand. That's right. They won the game in overtime. And then they've got Auburn, and Auburn had him beat. And of course, we know there was some controversy at the end on some of the calls, the foul call, Kyle Guy, whatever. I think it was a foul. He steps up and hits all three fairways. Like, yeah, uh, nice. fairways, all three free throws. <laughs> yep. And, and yeah, I'm, 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 I'm in my golf lexicon now. Um, but, you know, what are the odds? What are the odds? In the national championship game, you've got to have DeAndre Hunter hit a three to tie it with 12 seconds to go and withstand a last-second shot at the end of regulation to go win it in overtime. I mean, the odds are just, they're massive. I do feel badly in a way, and then maybe it's just because I'm in this bubble having been courtside for all these events, but it had the shortest shelf life of a majestic story as anything I've ever seen because right. along comes Tiger. The story was just, it was a beautiful, pristine story a tribute to, uh, a testament, I should say, to, to character and, like, facing adversities and challenges and to climb that mountain. You're going to keep getting kicked and tested. Can you do it? Can you, can you somehow figure a way to get out of this um, moment where the odds are stacked against you and, and you do it and you do it again and you do it again and you've been reminded about it for 350 days and yet you come back and repeatedly do it? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it, the story there is so deep. It's so big. And uh, I know it's lost a little bit today. We're just 10 days after it because mm -hmm. the Tiger thing kind of blew it out of the water. But I am lost in admiration for, for Tony Bennett and the program he runs and the kids that are on that floor and what they did to come back and, and win a championship on the heels of the most embarrassing loss in the history of the tournament. I feel like this is an exit interview, Jim Nance, for the uh, great sports moment so far of 2019. <laughs> <laughs> so let's turn to the schedule. Let's spin it a little bit forward yeah. here uh, that came out last night. Which games did you see that are on the CBS docket that you uh, said, oh, I can't wait to saddle up with Tony Romo and, and call? Well, if you put it that way, just to sit down with Tony and call a game, just to, I'd say every single one of them. Right, exactly. It doesn't matter the game. We have a ball. I mean, we just have the best time. But I loved our schedule. And it's a hard thing to do to keep everybody happy, as you know. Right. And, and, and look, our, our schedule is going to, as always, have eight pre-assigned um, best, best guess scenarios, national doubleheaders. Uh, there's some flexibility, obviously, along the way. And if there's week 17, we and Fox both get a doubleheader. So you get nine total. So you really want to see what did they drop in your lap for those 425s. And those 425s included Dallas at the Jets early in the season. Le'Veon Bell, it's like week five or six. 
Dallas, of course, is always a huge draw. That's a cross flex game that doesn't normally belong in our package, but this is some of the new programming they've done, the league has done in the last three or four years. That's a good one. Kansas City at New England in December. That's great. Is I believe it's December 8th. Yes, it monster is. game. I think that's the, at least going in, this, of course, repeat of that epic AFC championship game. That's um, about as good as it gets. We got New England at Philadelphia. Rematch of uh, Super Bowl 52. Uh, not bad. I mean, there's just a whole list of, I think, really high quality 425 games, and you know, I'm excited about that. I uh, I can't wait to get it started. I'm I'm taking a little deep breath because the yeah. last the last uh, well the first hundred days of the year, including that AFC Championship game, kind of gets lost in this mix of uh, that's right of, of games I've had a chance to cover. But it's been a whirlwind, and and I'm back on the air. I'm in Milton Head Island, South Carolina. I've got a tour event this weekend, and probably the best thing for me is to decompress by being on the air. With an event that's not at the master scale, but it's important to you know whoever's playing in it and the golf audience is is behind it. And then I'm going to go underground for a while, and uh, and just be with my family. They're here with me, yep. which is certainly is a blessing. And having them running around and making me feel whole again, and and being back in my most important role as a dad. But uh, yeah, the football season will be here before we know it. I love our schedule. And uh, I love being with Tony and Jim Rickoff and our whole team. It's awesome. Mike Arnold and Tracy Wolfson. It's awesome. Yeah, you got Ravens, Steelers, uh, Browns, Patriots, which is going to be uh, of note towards Browns, the end Patriots, of Oct- by October. The way. Now, I don't want to give away state secrets, but, you know, and I'm not a programmer. So it's, it's, there is, uh, of course, the opponent schedule that comes out the minute the regular season ends. Yep. You know the opponents, as you know. Right. But for some reason, it's more interesting finding out where the games are positioned on the calendar than who the opponents are. You know, that doesn't not a lot of fanfare at the end of week 17 about the opponent schedule. The big the big reveal is your show last night. But um, we do several of us are asked, and I have a very minor role in this, virtually negligible because mm-hmm. far more qualified people like Dan Weinberg in our place to figure this out. But I really wanted Cleveland, New England. I wanted Cleveland, New England, and I think that there's probably four or five games that we go to the league and say, we'd really like to keep these. We know we're not going to get all five of them. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think we probably got four out of the five. And my big thing, even before the Beckham trade was, Cleveland is a team on the rise, and Baker Mayfield against Tom Brady, uh, there will be a lot of energy in that building. And I really wanted to see us get that game. That was the one thing I pushed for. I knew that they were all over Kansas City, New England, and New England, uh, at Philadelphia, and all that kind of thing. But I was thrilled to see. That's a week eight doubleheader. Of course, now Beckham's on, uh, you know, on, on the scene, and it's interesting. I thought the league showed the Browns a lot of love they last did. night yep. with that schedule. I mean, they've, they've got four primetime games, which, okay, we, we, can, we can jockey on this all we want. And, and those are huge. But the 425s are huge. The 425 actually does a bigger national rating than the primetime games does, as you know this, too. It's one of the little kind of un, 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 unexplored or unappreciated numbers is the Fox and CBS 425 games actually end up at the end of the season have the biggest rating of any time block. And they've got, I believe, three Cleveland games in the 425 window, two of them are definitely going to be the national game. That one at New England and the one on Thanksgiving Sunday at Pittsburgh. Right. There's a game uh, on week nine where Cleveland's at Denver and at the same 425 window is Green Bay at the Chargers. So there's a hedge there. It could go either way. Green Bay is such a national team. I would say right now that's Green Bay. The Chargers is probably uh, going in as the favorite to be the big national game. Because Denver's a little bit of a wild card, let's face it. And, you know, we've got to see how Cleveland's going to react to it. I think they'll react well. But I would say Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland, New England, those are now, with the four prime times, those are six massive exposures for that franchise. They are. And, and Jim, thanks for the call. Really appreciate it. It's just great to hear. You're happy. We had Joe Buck on last night on the network. He's happy. But nobody's happier than, you know this, than Al Michaels having four Los (laughs) Angeles games. Nobody's happier than that. I was watching... (laughs) Uh, and after I texted you uh, last night and, and, and had, had some fun with you during your, while you were on the air, 
Uh, I texted Al and I said, I'm about to watch you come on. And I was, as I was writing the text, you know, you're, you're interviewing Al and I love Al. And I know you do too. We're lucky to have such a wonderful friend and yeah. someone that is, uh, is, represents the best who cares about us. And I, then I heard you mention the four games in LA. I know I've heard him lament for years. He never gets any breaks on this. So I texted him and, and he wrote me right back. And he's, uh, I think concerned. And they, you never know. You get flexed out of these games. I know that's right. You can, he's but pretty. you never yeah, he's know. Sitting pretty. He's got 25% of this year. He's, he's driving to work. Well, Jim, to so bring, bring it all. He deserves it. He bring, deserves it. Right. To bring it all full circle. You mentioned about being a dad. Being, I know you put the pause button on being a dad to call in. So head off to your family. I really appreciate the time, Jim. Love being with you, Rich. Right back at I you. really did. There's only one Jim Nance of CBS right here on The Rich Eisen Show. For more of The Rich Eisen Show, tune to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV for free on BR Live or download The Rich Eisen Show app.